Okay. Oh, not quite on. Good evening and welcome. It is so nice to see everybody here. For those of you watching at home, thanks for joining us. My name is Melissa, and I'm going to be sharing a missionary story with you tonight. Just for anyone that's interested, often we say it's for the kids, but if anyone's interested, there is coloring sheets at the back with some pencil crayons if it helps you to listen and color at the same time. I'm going to be telling you a story tonight um, that I have actually never told before. There's a number of missionary stories that I've told over the years as I've been involved with camp work and kids work, but this is a new missionary story to me that I've only read within the last year. I've been greatly encouraged with it, and my prayer is that you also will be greatly encouraged by it. I'm going to tell you the story of a couple named John and Betty Stam, and I want to start with John's story, and actually I want to start with John's father. John's father was actually born in Holland, and his family for three generations had owned a tavern and they, how was it said? It was said that they were involved with lots of godless living. But John's father, even though he entertained people at the, at the tavern, found that very quickly his life felt very empty and was very void. And so he spent many nights awake knowing that his life was not worth anything. So he immigrated to America, hoping to find uh, purpose in his life and hoping to make his, uh, to make his money. When he landed in America, a lady came to him and handed him a Bible that was both in Dutch and in English. And she handed him this Bible and she said, I want you to study this Bible so that you can learn how to read English. And as she walked away, she prayed. She prayed this. I have it here. She says, Lord, please help him to learn more than English as he studies your word. Help him to know the Savior. And John's father started reading the Bible so he could learn English because he could, he could compare the Dutch with the English and just try to figure out some of the English words. And before long, he was no longer studying English. He was studying God's word and he read it over and over and realized the truth of God's word. And John's father came to a saving faith of Jesus Christ. As he was in America, he met another woman. Uh, well, he met a woman. Sorry, I shouldn't say another woman. <laughs> Sorry, he met a lovely Christian girl and the two of them got married. He started a construction business that was very successful and him and his wife had eight children and that was the family that John was born into. And it's interesting because even though John's father had known a life of, of godless living, they raised their family and they purposed in their heart to raise their family in a very godly way. And there was a number of things that they did. First of all, John's father, on a regular basis, would hand out tracts, Christian tracts, to, to the Jewish people in their area. And then it got to be so that they were so busy with that, and then they started evangelizing on the street corners. And then they got to be so busy, they ne needed volunteers to help them with their evangelism on the street corners at the same time that John's dad was running a, a full-time construction company business. And it got to be so busy that they actually had to purchase a building because now they were having midweek building, uh, midweek meetings. And so John grew up going to church all the time, going to church meetings all the time. And then they bought a, then they, that building that they, uh, that they purchased was too small and they needed to buy a bigger building. And so John's father bought an old barn and converted it and they were able to sit 600 people in this building and they had rooms for Sunday school and they had rooms for, um, to teach people sewing and they had offices and then and they would have at least three times a week, they would have evangelistic meetings in this hall for 600 people on a regular basis. Not only were, was John's family involved in that kind of outreach on a regular basis, but every mealtime, as the Stam family sat down, a Bible was placed between each of their plates. And before they began to eat, each of their family members would read an entire chapter of scripture before they would eat. Now, just think about that for a minute, because John was one of eight, and there was his parents, so that was 10 chapters of scripture that they were reading before they ate. And even though John was growing up in a life where his family was serving over and over and over again and involved with outreach and involved in church work, and his brothers who were older came to know Christ at an early age, and he saw people miraculously converted. They saw street people who were, who were addicted to drugs and addicted to alcohol miraculously transformed. And John was in his, in his teens, and he still, even though he saw those miraculous transformations, it was a very slow work in his own heart. And his own heart was actually quite hardened against some of the messages that he would be hearing at some of the evangelistic meetings. And so there was one night that he was at an evangelistic meeting and the, and the speaker actually said, he said he wanted everyone that was not a Christian to stand up. 
But John was too embarrassed to stand up. He was probably about, he was 13 or 14 at the time. He was too embarrassed to actually publicly stand up and say he wasn't a Christian in front of his, in front of his family because he knew his family's stance. So he sat down. So he stayed sitting, and the speaker said, okay, now that all those people sit down, I want to stand up, I want you to sit down, and if you know that you are a Christian, if you know that you have given your life to the Lord Jesus, I want you to stand up. But now John was too embarrassed to keep sitting, so he stood up, and his brother turned to him and said, John, praise the Lord, you are finally a Christian. They had been praying for John for a long time, and he said, John, go to the front and show everyone that you've publicly made this decision. Well, there's no way John was going to the front because he knew he was just standing to, because he didn't want to sit. So his heart was actually heavier than ever. And he went home that night and his brother was thrilled. And they came home and said, and announced to his entire family, tonight John became a Christian. And John's heart became heavier and heavier because he knew the truth within his own heart. He went to school the next morning, burdened by his need for a savior and knowing that he had seen people miraculously converted And he realized that he didn't need to be converted from the sin that he saw of other people. He needed to be converted and saved from his own self-righteousness. And so on, at his school desk one day, in the middle of school, he quietly bowed his head and gave gave his life over to the Lord. He still had a lot of work to do. There was still a lot of work to do in his heart because he was too embarrassed to actually participate in the mission work that his family was that he was involved in. Because they did a lot of street preaching, right? So they were they would go to street corners and they would tell a gospel presentation. And there was no way that John wanted to be involved with that in case some of his school friends saw what he was doing. But it came time to summer, and even though John was kind of hesitant, and he was pretty independent, even as a child, if his button fell off one of his clothes, he would rather sew it back on himself than ask his mother to do it. Um, and it came to summertime, and he asked his dad, how come they're not doing their street outreach like they're doing all the time? And his dad turned to him and said, John, we have no one to lead the team. It's up to you to lead it. And again, God used that circumstance, and God convicted him, and John very half-heartedly kind of reluctantly started to lead a street preaching team on the street corners. And the times that he used to avoid all his family members doing that, and now he was standing up there on the street corner, and God really worked in John's heart and gave him a love for the people that didn't know the Lord Jesus. And over through that summer, John's heart was, 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 was changed to move from completely avoiding and being reluctant to serve in that way to, to wanting to honor God in that way and seeing masses of people and his heart was broken for all those people that did not know the Lord Jesus. After John was involved with that um, for the summer, he um, went to college and he learned some business. Um, originally, before you know, he had become a Christian, he wanted to make a bit of money. He was a bit business orient- orientated, so he went to college, got a degree in, in some business, and he was now working in New York, um, not far from where he grew up. And um, he would sit in his office and he would look out and he would see the docks of New York and see the people working and all the different nationalities. And over time, John's heart just continually broke for all those people from all different places of the world that did not know the Lord Jesus. So after he worked there for a couple of years, he resigned and said he needed to go to Moody Bible Institute, if that's in Chicago, because he wanted some practical hands-on training to how to teach people about the Lord Jesus, how to evangelize to people, and he wanted some more specific training how to do that. So off John went to Moody Bible College, Moody Bible Institute it was called at the time. His boss, his employer, was not too pleased. John was a good worker and kind of said to John, how about you stay, how about you not go? But John was determined, nope, he was gonna head off to Moody Bible Institute. Okay, so take that story of John and put it to the side here. Now I wanna tell you about a little, girl, about a li- a little bit about a lady named Betty. And Betty was born in the United States, but when she was only six months old, she traveled to China because her parents had signed up with the Presbyterian Church to be missionaries in China. So although Betty was born in the States, she grew up in China and her parents were missionaries. Interestingly, she was the oldest of five children, and her parents actually, even though she lived in China, she had very little um, interaction with the Chinese people. So the Chinese would have very long church services and her parents actually didn't take their kids to the Chinese services. They had their own worship services at home. 
And so they lived in their mission house and their, and their parents were involved with lots of different work. But Betty and her siblings were actually kind of stayed very close to the mission house and had very little to do with a lot of the nationals. They did have some helpers at their house. They had an, a ma, which was like a, like a nanny that helped look after them. They had a cook um, and, the, and the children were allowed to like, you know, um, chat with them and get to know them. Um, but, not, but not much um, interaction with the Chinese outside of that. Also, interestingly, the kids, Betty and her siblings, would often sneak around to their helpers' um, residences where they were living, kind of in this compound, and try to ask them for the Chinese food that they were eating. Because Betty's parents actually thought that Chinese food was no good for their kids, and so had them eat kind of American food in China, but the kids would sneak around to the back and try to, you know, gather some of the Chinese food from some of their helpers. Betty talks about having a very, very... um, joyous upbringing. And she talked often about what a great job her parents did. They had a very structured house uh, um, that they would have breakfast and then they would sing a song and they would read some scripture together. And then her her parents would be involved in some ministry work. Her dad did some outreach. But at 11 o'clock every single day, her dad put um, all his ministry stuff aside, all his missionary work aside. And for 11 to 12, that one hour, his dad spent in vigorous outdoor activity is how it was proclaimed, um, where they ran around and they, they played games and such um, outdoors. Then they would have lunch. And then after lunch, everyone, all the children were required to lie down for a little bit. And then they had a bit of free time and they would have um, dinner. Um, uh, let me just make sure I don't forget anything because there's some pretty fun stuff that happens. As a young teen, Betty was then sent to boarding school, which is pretty common. Um, so she was the oldest. She went off to boarding school. She spent Christmases and summer breaks with her family. And over time, as she got a bit older, more and more of her siblings came and joined her at boarding school. And for the summers they would spent together, they would often go... And I didn't realize this, but there was parts of China that became very, very hot. So many of the missionaries at the time, this is in about 1920s, many of the missionaries at the time, it got so hot in the the innermost parts of China that the missionaries would often spend the summers at the coast where it was a little bit cooler. And so that's where where Betty spent her summers was at the coastal areas in China. When Betty was 17 years old, she was finished boarding school and she was going to head back to the States to go to college. Her parents knew that this was kind of the last time that their whole family would be together because once Betty, once they, their par- her parents were due a furlough, so once they got to the States, they knew Betty was going to stay there. And so their family actually took a six-month trip from China all the way across the world. They stopped in Italy and Greece and Egypt and Israel, and they stopped in Europe all along, and they took six months as a family to spend that time together. And um, they had a really great time together as a family. They made many amazing memories. But this is what was said um, as they left, as all of their family left China. There was five of them as they got on the boat. Um, She says, our parents never urged it, but all five of us children expected to return to China as missionaries in the future. So the parents never spoke to them. Never, I shouldn't say never spoke. It wasn't that the parents were pushing them and say, you guys should come back as missionaries. There was no pressure. There was just the kids all assumed that when they left China to go to school, at one stage they would all come back to be missionaries there. When the, Betty did arrive in the United States, she came down with a really bad case of rheumatic fever, and she was actually bedridden for months and months and months. Her heart became very, very weak, so she had to lie flat on her back for many, many months. And it was during that time that she realized that she had a love for writing poetry. Um, so I'll not share any of that with you today, but that was what that happened, But her, uh, what she discovered during that time. But her heart never truly recovered from that rheumatic fever at that time. So there was things that happened all all throughout the rest of her life where she had to adapt because her heart was weak. A year later, Betty's health was well enough that she could attend college. She attended college for a year and went to a conference that summer that dramatically changed her life. For John, he remembers as a teenager coming to a point and realizing that he needed to be saved from his sin. Betty had come to know the Lord at a very early age. She didn't have a strong memory of that actual point when she had committed her life to Christ. And she just gradually grown in the grace, the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. And she came, went to this conference after her first year of college that dramatically changed her life. And she was just challenged to give her all to the Lord Jesus, to give all her talents, all her gifts, all of who she is. And this is what she writes in her journal when she gets home. I don't know what God has in store for me. I really am willing to be an old maid missionary. 
or an old maid anything else in my life for that matter, if God wants. It's as clear as daylight to me that the only worthwhile life that's worth living is one of unconditional surrender to God's will. And from that point on, her verse, kind of her motto in life was Philippians 1.21, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And she, at this point, she began to pray, oh God, if it is so your will, may nothing prevent me from returning back to China someday as a missionary. And she was very cautious as she prayed because her heart's longing and her heart's desire was to go to China, but she was just so aware that that was what her heart wanted. She wanted to be so sure that that's what God had wanted her to do. So at one point, she became very aware there was several leper colonies in Africa, and she thought maybe that she should serve there. And there was just a battle within her heart to just try to assure that her heart um, was following what God had asked her to do. And at that time, she enrolled at Moody Bible College, Moody Bible Institute, sorry, to gain practical experience in leading people to Christ. Um, At Moody, she served in prison ministries and street meetings. She chose Moody because she wanted to learn how to win souls for Christ. Betty was described as quiet and gentle and gracious and sincere. She was naturally reserved, but people sought her out, looking for her advice and her wisdom. She was never hurried and always had time to take time to listen. John had arrived at Moody one year after Betty. Okay, so Betty was there for a full year, and then that's when John quit his uh, job working for that um, in New York and joined uh, and came to Moody as well. At Moody Bible Institute, there were several prayer meetings that took place throughout Chicago and throughout Moody. And John started to attend a prayer meeting that was run by uh, CIM. It was at that time China Inland Mission. They have now changed their name to Overseas Missionary Fellowship. I wrote it down because I was going to keep calling it. I will refer to it as China Inland Mission because that's that's what it's referred to at this time. But if you're ever going to look anything up, it is now Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Um, China Inland Mission, CIM, as it was also known, had a prayer meeting in Chicago on a Monday night run by missionaries that had been in, in, in China and were now at home. And John started attending that prayer meeting on a Monday night along with several others. And at the same prayer meeting was Betty, who was also there at that prayer meeting praying for the missionaries in China. And the two of them met and the prayer meetings focused on the various needs of missionaries and needs around the world and different things um, that were happening. John wrote to his parents on a regular basis, and it was actually quite a problem, not a problem, but a point of consternation because John was writing to his parents saying he had this, this, this longing in his heart to be an overseas missionary, to, to serve overseas, to go overseas. And his dad would write back to him these words, John was, very, I should say, John was confused because his parents did not seem supportive of his desire to commit his life to overseas a missionary work. His entire family had spent thousands upon thousands of hours serving at the Star of Hope mission. That was the mission his dad had started. Um, they were doing evangelistic work in Sunday school. So why, he didn't understand why his parents would not support him in this and his desire to go as an overseas missionary. But John's dad knew that, he was, that John's dad was getting older. John's dad knew that there was a younger person needed to serve at the Star of Hope Mission in um, New Jersey. That's where they were living. And John's dad had secretly hoped that John would go to Moody, finish his course, and come back to New Jersey and take up the leadership of the Star of Hope Mission because there was a great need for someone to serve in that role. Um, John's father John's father writes to him and says... um, I just want to make sure I find it here. Why not think of other... So then John's dad finally comes to the the conclusion, okay, so so maybe John is going to go overseas. This is kind of an ongoing conversation. And John's dad writes to him and says, why not think of other countries other than China where the work isn't so dangerous and there wouldn't be so much hindrance against some of your work? So John writes again, John continues to pray. And you have to imagine, John grew up in 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 a very devout family. So So not having his father's blessing in this caused him a lot of heartache and a lot of concern and a lot of prayer because John honestly felt that God was leading him to overseas missionary work and to have not the support of his father didn't feel like the right thing going forward. Finally, after several months, John's dad wrote him this. He says, may the Lord richly bless you and guide you by his Holy Spirit to do his will. We must pray that even more men go to China. 
So at this time, it was about 1930, 1929, and things were not good in China. There was a lot of unrest and a lot of loss of life, and missionaries were not spared. There, some were held captive, some missionaries were held captive, some were killed. In 1927, um, a few years later, 50% of missionaries that went to China never returned home because they were killed on the mission field. And this is the, this is the country that both John and Betty are feeling called to. It was also reported at this time, listen to this, it was also reported that some of the missionaries that had been held captive had begun preaching to their captives. Um, and the captives liked them so much, the captives said this, these old people are too good to kill, we sure wish they would become communists, is how they were told. <laughs> when John entered Moody, he had enough money saved up for one year of schooling. And his family assumed that once John was out of money, that John would approach them and ask for money and that his family would support him in his, um, in his schooling. But John had actually determined that he was not going to ask his parents to money. He felt if God was going to call him to the mission field, he needed to trust God for all of his needs. And it was not an easy time. Remember, so now we're coming into 1930s. Things were not good in the States. Uh, I think unemployment hit 25%. People were losing jobs. There was no money. There was uh, bills that couldn't be paid. People were losing all that they had. And yet John could report um, over and over again, God just, and now John had to sacrificially live. There was a lot that he lived without. But there was one Christmas that he was offered a ride home. Uh, a, man, a guy who had a car and was gonna drive back to his, uh, his parents' place. Um, and he said to John, John, I'm happy to give you a ride. It's just that my car has no heater and it's going to be very, very cold. And John actually had no warm socks at the time. Um, and so he had four shirts that he was kind of rotating through. And that day he got up and he put one of his shirts on and it ripped as he put it on. And he, he said, Lord, I cannot go home with a ripped shirt because my mom will know that he don't have the money to buy a new one. And he went out along the water and he prayed and on the way back, um, he found a $5 bill that was able to get him two new shirts and a pair of warm socks that lasted him for years and years and years. And he was just, it was just interesting to see how God had provided for him in different things. Those socks actually, um, he writes letters um, later on, um, on when he's on the mission field, writing back saying, as I put those wool socks on, I am reminded of the Lord's provision and the Lord's goodness. During John's second year at Moody, another thing that was constantly on his mind was his deepening relationship with Betty. Um, he was impressed by Betty's spiritual maturity and his, her fervency for mission work. She all, Betty also had a favorable, favorable impression of John. At 6'2", he stood out in a crowd. He had handsome features, this is what Betty writes, a slightly receding hairline and rounded eyeglasses. But more than that, Betty was attracted to John's strong Christian character. Their relationship started out as simple friends and gradually began to deepen, but the problem was they didn't want to, um, they were both guarded because utmost in their mind was God's calling to each of them individually and they could not enter into a deep relationship until they knew that God was calling them into the same place. So Betty graduated first because she was there a year ahead of John. She graduated from Moody and after much prayer, she knew that the Lord was guiding her to um, to uh, work in China, so she applied to CIM, uh, China Inland Mission, she passed her medical, and she was approved to work with China Inland Mission. And um, just shortly after she graduated, she was getting ready to prepare to sail over to China. Independently, both of them were sensing God leading them towards service in China, but it was anything but safe and secure, and it was very, very dangerous at the time. In 1929, the director of China Inland Mission telegraphed home appealing for 200 new workers, 200 new missionaries in the next two years. The desire was for single men who could carry out itinerant work. So what they needed is men, single men to come and have a base and to be able to travel out to the outlying areas to tell people about the Lord Jesus. So remember, in 1927, 50% of missionaries went to China, never returned home, and two years later, China Inland Mission saying, we need 200 more men to come and do itinerant work. The goal was met on time with 200 people in two years. Only 84 of them were men, and 116 of them were women, and one of them was Betty. Betty Scott was one of, Betty was one of the ones that responded. She, she, she attended um, candidate school, and she was about to depart for China in the fall. John, John also felt called to be one of that number, but he still had a year left of Moody, and he still um, didn't feel 100% for sure that he was going to be serving in China. 
And so um, Betty carried on for the summer. John missed her mightily and desired to carry their relationship via correspondence. Yet inwardly, he was just restrained to do so. So he did not feel he could actively promote a relationship until he was fully sure of where God would have him serve. Betty made preparations to head out to China. She got all her things in place. And she, uh, she was, so she, you have to imagine she was in Chicago. If you think about uh, Ontario, I guess that's, you know, you know kind of underneath-ish, or Ontario-ish, and if we think of a North American map. And so she would travel from that area. She would travel across the states, and then she would take a boat from the West Coast. Um, and so she had said goodbye to her family, and she stopped at Moody for a day to see John. Um, before she was going to take a train across to the West Coast. And so John and Betty spent the day together. They went to the beach. They talked. They enjoyed their day together. And at the end of the day, they actually went to the prayer meeting where they had first met, the prayer meeting that was run by the China Inland CIM missionaries. And at the end of the, meet, the prayer meeting, everyone went home, and John and Betty, Betty um, to, uh, the, took the leader. They had known this leader now for a few years and took him aside and just confided that they had a love for one another, but they were just holding on the relationship until they were for sure knew where God was calling them to do. And the, um, John says this, speaking for us both, we leave the matter in the Lord's hands, but feel that he is bringing us together. The leader of the prayer meeting said, and he thought we had not noticed anything <laughs> between the two of them. Betty left and they parted actually for potentially years. They did not know at that point when they would see each other again. John would not propose at that time that he would have to wait for years. John was not convinced about where he was going and CIM was looking for single men to serve and John felt that he might be one of those single men and in his, in his mind he had thought that he would serve for five years as a single man before he would get married. Betty sailed to China and was delighted that some of the language that she had to learn started to come back to her that she had learned as a child and when she was at boarding school. And at the same time, John writes in his diary, I try to remain diligent in my studies. But I think Betty was on his mind quite a bit. April came, that was the end of John's time at Moody, and John was chosen to be the, uh, the speaker at their commencement. <clears throat> And his speech is entitled, Go Forward. It was a stirring challenge. It was a big challenge to advance the cause of the gospel at home and abroad. He said it was time to courageously take the gospel to those who are perishing. And he said, now was the time. So again, it was 1932. The Great Depression had gripped America. There was a severe shortage of money and jobs in the U.S. And this is what John says. All forms of Christian work at home and abroad are feeling the effects of the depression. Let us remind ourselves that the Great Commission was never qualified by the clause that's, that called for advance only if funds were plentiful and if no hardship was involved. On the contrary, we are told to expect tribulation and hardship. Incomes are failing, men are losing employment, and bank accounts are being wiped out but we dare not turn back because the way, look dark, the way looks dark. He was referring to Matthew 28, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. John said this, he says, we must press forward, we cannot wait when a million souls a month die in China in a, to a Christless eternity. China was very deep onto John's heart. So John graduated one year after Moody. He attended a six-week orientation, and he was finally then accepted into China Inland Mission, the same organization that Betty was part of. And on July 1st, I'm sorry, on July 1st, he was officially accepted. The prospect of marriage to Betty was very much on his mind, and his journal entry read this. I have prayed much about this, perhaps this more than anything else ever. I have studied my Bible for guidance and can see no hindrance. May God frustrate everything that is not of him. So John spent the summer getting ready to go to China. He had some dental work done. He got his eyes checked. He did some uh, shopping and got some things, pr things prepared. Um, he did have a surgery that left him extremely weak and unable to lift heavy loads. Finally, in August, he had recovered, and it was time for him to, uh, to, uh, head, to head west. He was in Chicago, and he too was going to have to take a train across the country. And there in Chicago, he wrote a letter to Betty finally proposing and saying, would she consent to marry John someday? Didn't know when, but he was now happy to say, will you marry me someday? He found, now felt justified in proposing since the Lord was obviously leading them in the same direction. 
The rule for China Inland Mission at that time was each missionary had to serve at least a year's term on the mission field before they could get married. So they knew that that piece was, was there um, aside from everything else. On September 8th, 1932, 40 people gathered at the train station to see John off. They read scripture together. They were sang a couple of hymns. And John got on the train and started traveling across um, to Vancouver is where he sailed from, actually. And he received a letter from Betty. But in the letter from Betty, there was absolutely no talk about his proposal. So that left him a little bit confused. And as he, so as he traveled across the states, um, he, oh, yeah, so he, he, on the train ride, sorry, on the train ride across to Vancouver, he received a, a batch of letters from family and friends. One was from Betty, and Betty says nothing about this marriage proposal, which left John fairly confused. At the same time, so again, let's leave John on the train heading to Vancouver, and let's think about where Betty is just for a minute. Betty's been in China serving, but Betty had been going through a number of fairly difficult circumstances. A missionary in China had just been captured and had never heard or seen from again. She and her fellow missionary, she was working with another single girl. They had to leave their mission station because it was too dangerous for them to stay for there for right now. And then she was also confused because she had not heard from John in a very long time. So things were not well for her in China, but things were also not going well that well for her heart. So John arrives in Vancouver. He gets ready to get onto his boat to sail to China, and he receives 36 letters. It's very specific that he got those 36 letters. Scans through them. Nothing from Betty. Um, several weeks later, John's boat docked in Japan. Um, he had to dock there before, he, um, before they headed to the final stretch down to China. And there was a letter from Betty's father, but still no letter from Betty. And in the letter from, from Betty's father, it says that Betty was quite confused as to the state of their relationship because she had not heard from him in quite a while, and he offered John some fatherly advice. And it is not recorded which advice he gave to, gave, gave to John. John boated the, um, several days later, John's boat arrived in China. John was eager to get a glimpse of life in China. And what he saw overwhelmed him because there was an immense poverty everywhere. He was completely overcome by that poverty. And he said, here I am dressed in good clothes, looking to be what a millionaire. But a glorious surprise was there in Shanghai when John docked in China. For uh, Betty had had to leave her mission station and then she had had trouble with her tonsils. And so then she was actually sent to Shanghai for surgery. There was a delay. And then John arrived in Shanghai. And all misunderstandings between the two of them were cleared up very quickly. And there they solidified their proposal. They still had to wait that year to get married. That was what was CIM had recommended. And one missionary actually uh, joked to John and said that John should maybe pay the medical bill, bill for Betty since he got the benefit from the doctor's care and the surgery. In his journal, John writes this, Hallelujahs will wonders never cease. Our heavenly father has so arranged it that Betty was here in Shanghai. They spent a few days together. They bought wedding rings, and then they separated. Betty was to go back to where she was serving with another single missionary, and John had some language school that he had to attend here in China. And they actually didn't see each other for a full year after that. So John attended language school, and they actually, this is, listen to this, the, the guys at the language school actually weren't allowed to leave. There was, it was a compound, right? So they had these houses that were together and a big wall around it. And the guys actually were not allowed to leave the compound very much because it says they didn't want all the men to cause excitement amongst the people. So I'm not sure what that means, but they had to stay within their compound. But there was rolling hills all around the compound, and John was overcome because all on the rolling hills, there was, there was actually just dead bodies all over the hills. And John was just struck by this, what, what was happening? What was, what was going on? And actually, amongst, in amongst the, these bodies that were just there, there was also coffins. But there was so much death and killing in China, and John was overcome again by the number of people that did not know Christ. John eagerly awaited Betty's weekly letters and was often frustrated because the postal service was not quite as regular or as he would like. Anyways, <laughs> Betty was now serving in a town called, I'm not going to say it right, Fo Young. Missionaries had been there a decade earlier. They had had to leave, and there was a, only a handful of Christians in that area. 
So Betty and this girl were gonna go back after missionaries had been there. Uh, there was, I think there was less than a dozen believers. They had to leave them because of the danger. And the missionaries had been burdened for this dozen believers that were left in that town because there was no one to shepherd them. So about 10 years later, Betty and her, this girl, Katie, were able to go back to Faoyang to find out, to try to find these believers, to try to encourage them. And they couldn't believe what they found when they got back. Because when they went back there, despite the persecution, despite the dangers, there was 250 believers that were meeting on a regular basis in that church on a weekly basis. The Lord was working mightily, mightily among them, but they did not have much Bible knowledge about all they could do. This is what was said of those believers there. All that they could do is come together and sing and pray. We are desperately praying for teachers to come and to teach these believers. So what Betty and Katie would do is they would start in this area and they would go out to outlying areas and do like little itinerant trips to teach people about the Lord Jesus. Um, so her and this Katie girl went on one trip and they stopped at a market town. And um, this is what Katie writes. She says, it was a market town and every man, woman, and child for miles around was selling their produce, right? So everyone came to this market town and were selling their wares. Um, and everything was covered in flies, when the flies saw us, they were tickled pink and made for us. <laughs> so did the people, they said. We went to an inner room in a mud house, and the people rushed at us as though we were a couple of footballs. And so the landlady was trying to protect them, and so she was from, because no one had seen, everyone wanted to see these, 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 these foreigners that had come to this little village. And so the landlady had taken Katie and Betty and kind of bodily shoved them into a room and slammed the door shut. And Katie and Betty were, were stuck in a room that was dark with a pair of chopsticks and a plate of food. And they said they couldn't tell whether they're eating their food or the flies as they ate that night. And the next village, they stayed the night there. And then the next place they went and had a little chapel. And Katie and Betty were going to sleep in the attic, but the rats were too noisy. And so then they went down, one of the, Katie went downstairs and slept on one of the pews. Betty says, I was too tired to move my bedding. I'll wait to see if someone runs across, one of them runs across my feet. <laughs> That was what was happening with Betty at that time. Um, but they were encouraged with the things that were happening. But again, there was still a lot of dangers that were taken on. Betty and Katie returned to the compound on a Sunday afternoon while everyone was at church. Uh, communist soldiers came, came in and sat down as if they were going to stay. They, they had a school there for girls at the time. The communist soldiers went in, took all the desks for the school and put them out in the yard. And then the communist soldiers all sat into the schoolroom um, intending to stay for a long time. And everyone got down on their knees and prayed. And a couple hours later, a whistle was blown and all the soldiers stood up and left the compound. So they were, you know, wrought between seeing God do some great things and then the danger and then seeing them, God, free them um, from this other danger. John finished, so let's go back to John. John finished his, his language study. He was sent out to work with a couple named, called the Birches um, who were already there. And John came alongside them and was learning the language and doing itinerant work as well. And John writes this. This is the kind of work I hope to be doing for years to come, getting out into the country, helping to build up a few struggling saints, and here and there preaching to the heathen in the towns and villages at every tea shop along the road. On one journey that they went, they passed a small temple that was dedicated to the weasel, an animal that many people had revered. On one side of the temple, there was a long pole, and people would attach like... Um, uh, like if they had a sore arm, they would make like a, a stuffed arm out of whatever cloth and put it on the pole so that the weasel would remember that they needed to be held, uh, healed um, of, this, of their sore arm that they had. In October, so a year after John arrived in China, John and Betty met up again and they were married in um, in, uh, in where Betty's parents, um, um, kind of in that area, they had a missionary, they had a, they had a wedding service there. Um, someone, it was a tennis court that they had, and so someone inside the house played the wedding march, and they opened the window so that everyone in the court could hear, and John and Betty were married that day. Unknown to John at that time, <clears throat> Betty's parents were, allowed, were able to attend the wedding because they were missionaries in China, but unknown to John at that time, his parents in New Jersey, <clears throat> half a world away, got out of bed at 2.30 in the morning to pray for John and Betty for that hour, that God would bless them and that God would honor their marriage and that God would use them. John and Betty went on the honeymoon and for the first year of their marriage, they, uh, no, sorry, for the, yeah, for the first year, they joined where John was working and they did itinerant work um, and learned the language and kept working. But the goal was that John and Betty would head to a village called Janan, uh, yeah, 
Jinan, I'm not gonna say that right, and the purpose of this first year of marriage was that John and Betty were gonna go to that village and they were gonna start a pioneer missionary work there. So everything for that first year was John and Betty getting ready to serve in that little village and to teach people about the Lord Jesus in that little village. It wasn't long until um, John and Betty were expecting their first child and um, a year after they were married, little Helen was born. John was warned not to expect too much out of an, a newborn infant, but he wrote a letter saying, you should see her. She really is the cutest little thing and would do for any baby show as far as good looks are concerned. <laughs> Helen was a very good baby. And soon after her arrival, John left on a journey to go to Janan to make sure it was safe to move their entire family there. Uh, John traveled with another missionary. They went to that town and the town magistrate came out and said, yes, it is safe. There's a few things going on um, in the surrounding areas, but I promise you, your family will be safe. I personally will assume safety for your family if anything comes up. So after much prayer, John and his uh, fellow missionaries decided that it was time to move his family to this, to this village. Uh, their possessions were transferred in five wheelbarrows to 70 miles um, I know, yeah, and on the way they stopped, so they walked the 70 miles to this, to this little village. Uh, their stuff went ahead of them and they stopped another missionary and they spent time with that missionary and it was said that Betty, with her, she wasn't able to do a lot because of her heart, but she welcomed all the women and girls that came to see her and everyone liked her. It was said of John that he was one of the finest Christian men that they had ever met and he will make a marvelous missionary. <clears throat> John and Betty finally arrived in Janan, and they were living in a large old Chinese house, and they were warm, welcomely warmed by the people. Um, their first service on Sunday, they had two, uh, two days after they arrived. It was Sunday. They had a Sunday service that Sunday, and it was attended by about six people. Four of them were their helpers, two of them were themselves, and two people wandered in off the street to see the foreigners and then headed back out again. But John and Betty were very excited about the possibilities of what God was going to do in this little village. <clears throat> Are you ready? Two weeks later. Two weeks later, a messenger came to their door and said, John, there are soldiers coming. You must leave immediately. John said, don't be alarmed. They won't come to the small place. And they continued on with their daily work. An hour later, another man ran up the street. Quickly, hurry. It is becoming dangerous. The soldiers are coming. You must leave. And Betty said, do not be afraid. We trust in God. There is nothing to fear. But at that point, John said, I wonder if we should just gather just a few things in case we need to leave for a few days. So their cook, whose name was Lee, was sent to order chairs. So what that meant was it was like, uh, it's like a chair um, that was carried by people. So you would sit on this chair and then there was two kind of, there was poles underneath and the, and the men would, would, would carry you in these chairs. So chairs were ordered, right? Because Betty, has, whose heart wasn't good, wouldn't be able to travel. So Lee went off to find some chairs and, to, and some men to carry their chairs. Um, so Lee came back. He was able to get the men, but not the chairs because everyone had already started to leave. There was one gate that was still open in the city and they were told to head out to that gate. But at that moment, there were some gunshots that went off and, every, and the chairmen that were there then fled, um, and they knew it was too late for them to leave. So John and Betty's house, where they were, they had a house, and it was surrounded by a wall. So they went inside their house, they locked the door into the wall, they locked the door into their house, and they got down and they knelt down and they prayed. And they prayed that God would protect them and keep them safe. Um, it was only a short time later that the communist soldiers came and beat down the door to, their, to the wall, surrounding their house, and they were now banging on the door of their house. Sorry, did I say that right? They banged down the door of the wall, and so now they were at the door of the house, and John turned and said, what shall we do? And Lee, their cook, says, if we let them in, it's over, and if we don't, it's also over. So John opened the, decided to open the door if they were coming anyway. He opened the door. There was four guys that were there, and John said, welcome. It must have been a hard journey for you. What are, tell me what your names are. And the soldiers were a bit taken back. Um, and then they started going through John and Betty's house looking for money and medicine. So they, where's your medicine? So John had a little bit of ointment he gave them. John told them to take whatever they wanted. Remember, John and Betty only had five wheelbarrows, so it wasn't that they had an enormous amount of things. But John and Betty told them to take whatever they wanted. And Betty says, um, you must be thirsty. Let me make you some tea and get you some cake. So Betty made tea and served them cake. The soldiers got angrier 
<clears throat> because they wanted money, and John and Betty only had about 40 or $50 with them. So John and Betty gave them the 40 or 50, the 40 or $50, and the soldiers weren't happy with that, so they took John off and took him and left Betty and little Helen, the baby who was three months old, at home. Um, but then just a couple hours later, the soldiers came back and took, John, uh, took Betty and the baby, and they were all held prisoners for that night. Um, it was that night, I should just uh, remember that I made slides, so let me just, um, I know, <laughs> sorry. This is a picture of John and Betty. This is their wedding picture, just before I get back to their story. That's uh, John and Betty in the middle, and they had some friends from Moody and some local missionaries that came and visited with them. I don't know if you can read this, but if you can, I'm going to read it as well. And this is the letter that John wrote that night that him and Betty and baby Helen were, has, be, were prisoners. Dear brethren, he's writing to the China Inland Mission. My wife, baby, and myself are today in the hands of communists in the city of Zhanin. I think that's how it said. That was, I looked it up and that's what it said. Their demand is $20,000 for our release. All our possessions and stores are today in their hands, but we praise God for peace in our hearts and a meal tonight. God grant you wisdom in what you do and us fortitude, courage, and peace of heart. He is able and a wonderful friend at such a time. Things happened so quickly this a.m. They were in this city just a few hours after the ever persistent rumors really became alarming so that we could not prepare to leave in time. We were just too late. The Lord bless you and guide you. And as for us, may God be glorified whether in life or by death. <clears throat> John and Betty were held prisoners that night. The next day they were forced to walk 12 miles. John carried little Helen. Thankfully, Betty was given a horse to ride. Um, at one point, Helen began to cry and the soldiers discussed whether it was worthwhile keeping the baby or not. Um, and one of the, one, a, a prisoner who had just been released said, do not harm the baby, she has done nothing. And they said, well, that's your life or hers. And he said, then take my life. And he was killed on the spot. That night they were brought to uh, the next village, the village that was 12 miles over. Um, they were put into the postmaster's house. They knew him a little bit. The postmaster says, where are you going? John says, we do not know where they are going, said John, but we are going to heaven. The postmaster had offered them a little bit of fruit to eat, and John wrote another letter to China Inland Mission. They were then taken to an inner court, into an inner room. John was bound up and tied to a bedpost in a standing position, and Betty um, was able to take care of um, little Helen that night. Um, the next morning, they were, they were taken out of that little... John and Betty were stripped down to their underwear and forced to walk through the town. John was barefoot and given Betty his socks to wear. The communist soldiers taunted everyone in the village to come out and see what was going on, daring anyone to protest. One man actually had the courage to protest and said, do not harm these people. And they searched his house. They found a hymn book and a Bible, which made him, and that was enough evidence that he was a Christian and he was joined. He was added to John and Betty um, in their number. Um, John and Betty were brought to a place called Eagle Hill. And um, John turned and asked that mercy would be held, but that they would have mercy on this man that had tried to um, that tried to um, to try to help them. And John was ordered to kneel, and he was beheaded. Betty fell beside him, and she too was killed only moments after her husband. The news brought anguish to everyone around the world. A telegram was sent to John's parents, telling them of the death of John and Betty, and the response was this. Deeply appreciate your consolation. This is John's dad writing. Sacrifice seems great, but not too great for him who gave himself for us. Experiencing God's grace, believe wholeheartedly Romans 8, 28. No one in the village where John and Betty had been killed dared to go near the bodies. The communists were close. The soldiers were spying. They did not know um, who was watching or who, when they would return. Hiding in the hills was a Chinese evangelist named Lo. Lo was supposed to have met with John a few days earlier. So Lo had been watching from the hills, watching what had happened, and snuck down into the village at great risk to his own life to try to learn a little bit more about what had happened on Eagle Hill. But no one would speak to him, and it has now been 30 hours since John and Betty had been killed. And as Lo tried to find out information and no one would speak to him, he started his way out of the village, and an old woman whispered to him and said, there's a foreign baby, and pointed to the house the house that John and Betty had spent their last night in. Lo walked into the house, and there was baby Helen, wrapped up in her bedclothes in a little sleeping bag, um, 
where she had stayed there since her parents had left her, wrapped them lovingly. They had put um, two $5 bills in her diaper and a change of clothes. Um, and miraculously, none of the soldiers had noticed or remembered or what, but there was Helen safe on that bed. Lo snatched her up, brought her to the hills to his wife to take care of. And again, Lo came down at tremendous risk of his own life, found two coffins, put the bodies in the coffins and hid the coffins in the long grass. The problem now was that all of Lowe's possessions had been taken. His own little boy of four was desperately sick, and they had 100 miles to travel on foot through a countryside that was laden with bandits. The children were put into two rice baskets, baby Helen, who was three months old, and their four-year-old son. I think, yep, there I have a picture of it. And they, because they had a foreign baby and everyone would recognize that it was a foreign baby. Um, they used the money that was in Helen's diaper to pay for the brave men that dared to carry that bamboo basket, those bamboo baskets across. Um, and they purchased a little bit of milk for Helen. They miraculously survived that 100 mile journey back to the hospital in Woohoo. That was the town that Betty, that Helen, excuse me, had been born in only three months earlier. She was pronounced in perfect health and dubbed the miracle baby. A telegram was sent to John's parents saying this, Stam baby safe. Memorial services were held all over the world. A service was held at Woohoo Hospital where baby Helen was born and then later brought back and declared in perfect health. The service was overflowing. Memorial service was held by Helen's parents in the area that they served in China. Numerous people, lots of people came to that service and Christians who attended that service confessed that their lukewarmness in their faith and just dedicated themselves fully to the Lord. A memorial service was held at the Star of Hope mission. Remember, that was the mission that John's parents started. And when the auditorium that fit 600 people was filled to overflowing, a loudspeaker was attached to a church across the, across the street to accommodate all those who had come to hear the service of John and Betty. A memorial service was held at Moody Bible Institute where John and Betty had graduated from only a few years earlier. At the close of the service at Moody, 700 students stood up and said, here I am, send me, and dedicated themselves to missionary service and a land full of unemployment going to a land full of bloodshed. Another 200 dedicated themselves to missionary service at Wheaton College, which was very close to Moody Bible Institute. Their death was wi widely publicized in secular newspapers as well as Christian, uh, Christian publications. And in the secular newspapers, it was an account of their death, but also it ran an account of their faith and why they were there. And these printed reports were also used of God for a Hindu gentleman read the report and became a firm believer in the Lord Jesus. A number of people volunteered to adopt baby Helen. Money came in from all around the world. She was given a full scholarship at a couple different schools, but Betty's parents took her in and raised her. Helen grew up, got married and had children of her own, but she has chosen to conceal her identity and no one knows where she is today. John and Betty's martyrdom challenged and inspired thousands of other believers literally around the world to serve him with greater, with greater consecration and courage. There continues to be, uh, that continues to be our prayer here, that we would be encouraged to serve him with greater strength and courage in all that we do. That's our story of John and Betty. I do have a couple of books if anyone's interested in reading them. I have a little pamphlet if the kids would like to read that, read a little bit about their story. It's a remarkable story, lots that I wasn't able to include tonight. But just as we close, let me finish with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for who you are. We're thankful that you love us, and we're thankful that you are doing something great. Lord, I just pray that within our hearts, within our beings, that we would serve you wholeheartedly, that we would hold nothing back. Lord, we pray for the Christians around the world who face persecution and hardship on a daily basis. And God, I just pray that we would, that we would um, love and serve you with our whole heart. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you and have a great evening. Can you still hear me? Oh, yeah, you can. 
Um, Gord was just saying, if, uh, you'll have to say it again, Gord, so I can say it through the microphone. One of your... One of my roommates in Bible school and one of our pastors, Art Birch. Okay. His parents were the... The Birches, yeah. Yeah, so Gord knows the, so one of the missionaries that John, the missionary that John worked with and then John and Betty worked with, the Birches, their son was in school with you, with, with Gord and a pastor. So very remarkable story. It was, it was equivalent, they said it was comparable to the, the effect of Jim Elliott and um, the martyrdom that happened there. 